Hey, hey, welcome back to PS Academy to another live uh, Q&A session. It's good to have you here with us. <laughs> uh, there were a couple comments that came in in the chat so uh, before we started today, actually. So uh, let me know if those show up uh, if you're joined afterwards. So Internet Privacy Advocate, it's great to see you. Uh, you were one of those that dropped um, some notes in the chat before we started, so I'm going to get to those pronto. And thanks for saying gorgeous playing. You probably know that one. That's one of my own arrangements. Um, I dreamed a dream from Les Mis. So uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I saw Hadar was here just a few minutes ago. He'll probably uh, tune back in very soon. Um, but looking forward to chatting with you, Hadar, as well. So um, if you are just joining us for the first time, or if you've been here before, but you haven't been here in a while, let us know in the comments where you're from, what part of the world you're in. Uh, it's always really cool to hear where everybody's from. I'm in Colorado, and it's 10 a.m., so like always, I've got my coffee. Um, just a couple quick notes before we get started today. Uh, I mentioned starting last, uh, last live stream. So two weeks ago, um, I have launched a brand new course called Next Level Piano, and it's a Christmas edition. I know it's not even Halloween yet, uh, <laughs> but there's a new course out. It's nine hours of lessons. Um, I've really tried to make it totally different than anything else you can get online. Really, really geared toward being more musical, learning how to play more musically, and not just teaching pieces of music, but actually teaching concepts that you can apply to everything. So there's a link to that in the description below if you're interested in checking that out. Um, and also, hey, Internet Privacy Advocate. Yes, yeah, 70 miles in Southeast Denver. That's awesome. We need to get together sometime. <laughs> so, um, Yes, so check out the course. Link is in the description below. Um, you can also, when you are, when you go to the course page, you can actually access one of the lesson modules completely for free. All you gotta do is sign up to Thinkific, just put your email address in, and you can see one. Um, there's something like almost 100 modules in the course. So um, be sure and go check it out. Anyway, let's, we'll leave that there for today. <laughs> and um, was there anything else I wanted to talk about? Maybe it'll come up as we, as we get into questions and answers and stuff like that. Internet Privacy Advocate, you say, is, is what you just played published? Yes, the, um, the arrangement from Les Mis is published and it's available on musicnotes.com. Uh, if, you, if you can type my last name, <laughs> I'll actually, I'll put it in. Uh, or you can send the description, I don't have to type it in the chat. If you can just copy and paste my last name and I Dreamed a Dream in the Music Notes search bar and it should come right up, it should be the first result. Or even just I Dreamed with my name should be the first result. Uh, and I don't know how many other people have arranged that particular piece, but they will, I don't know, they'll be, the arrangement will be there even if you just search for the title. So you can find it that way too. Um, okay, so Internet Privacy Advocate, you had a question before we started. Uh, so I'm gonna just jump in with what you asked to, to kick us off and then uh, we'll go from there and see what else people have to say. So you said you recently purchased a Samsung Ultra S8 for sheet music, and then you bought an iPad Pro. Was that both this month? <laughs> that, that sounds like a fun month of, of toys. <laughs> I, I love new electronics. Uh, so the two are exactly the same width in portraits. So what software do you use for sheet music on the iPad Pro? I use, and I love using, Fourscore. It's just spelled F-O-R-E-S-C-O-R-E. -E. I'll put it down here. Um, it used to be $15, it might be $20 now, uh, but it's, it's an incredibly powerful, sh um, it's really a PDF reader and annotator, but it's more than that too. Um, you can link uh, definitely audio recordings, so if you keep audio on your device, you can link audio recordings of the piece that you're working on right to the sheet music. So for example, um, you were talking about the uh, Yuja, Yuja's Encore of Orfeo that you had transcribed. You could pull her recording off YouTube, save it as an MP3, link it to your score, and you could have it accessible right in your iPad, uh, right from the page as you're working on playing it. Uh, and then you can you know, save your spot in the audio and all that stuff so you can see exactly what she's doing and listen to it while you follow along. And you don't have to be on two separate devices. Um, other like simple things that it includes that are really nice, there's a metronome built in, which is, which is nice. It's always handy to have one of those. Um, there, are, there are a huge number of annotation tools that you can use. 
it's like having pens and pencils and highlighters all at your disposal. Even if you don't have an Apple Pencil or a, a pencil for your tablet or anything, you can still use your finger and do a great job highlighting and marking up everything you need to. Um, and if you've seen um, a couple of my um, pre, pre-shot, pre-filmed masterclass videos, I use Fourscore on my tablet. I just do a screen recording and then I show that live, uh, well, live on the video while I annotate things and highlight things and all that. So if you want to see an example of what all that can look like, um, you can for sure check out the, uh, the WC Masterclass or the Chopin Waltz Masterclass that are posted on the channel here. I used Fourscore and the iPad Pro for both of those. Um, some other things, like for a professional performer, you can organize set lists that take selections from the library that you've stored on your iPad and you can put them in concert order so that you, when you just flip a page, it's like putting a binder together. You can just flip a page and you're on your next piece. You don't have to go searching for it. Uh, you can also, let's say you're, you're making cuts in something. And I know Internet Privacy Advocate, you like to do this kind of thing where you kind of rearrange um, published music and you rearrange it to be something that you like uh, even more than the published version. You can do that. You can actually like cut out pieces of the music or you can skip pages. You can place these buttons on the page where you can just hit it and you can skip it to literally anything else that's on the iPad. You could skip one page later in the same piece. You could skip to a totally different file. And then at the end of that, put another button and skip back to your original file. It's really powerful. Um, in fact, I just, I am using that feature while I prepare for a concert right now. Um, I am playing next month, actually uh, in about two, two and a half weeks. On Friday, November 11th, I'm playing um, a combination forehand piano and vocal program. Uh, and one of the big pieces on the program is um, Mussorgsky's Pictures in an Exhibition. Uh, so there are some of those, some places where we are using the forehand version that we're playing most of the piece from. But then there are a couple areas where we're referencing the solo piano version and even need to <laughs> do some rearranging of the bench and things and we go back and forth. So um, I've used the buttons that are in Fourscore to just go from, in performance, we're going to go from one file to a completely different file and then back, and it's all going to be seamless and work great. Uh, and then, of course, you can also get a Bluetooth pedal if that's something that you like. You can probably get that for both um, Mobile Sheets, the app that you use on Android, and also for Fourscore. They should both work because, um, yeah, Bluetooth should work pretty well. Uh, and Internet Privacy Advocate, I would love if you um, submitted a video of you playing the Orfeo transcription. That would be, that would be awesome. I love hearing everybody play. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, that would be really, really great. And if you want to do that or anybody else wants to do that, there's a link down in the description. Actually, there's a little bit of a, there's a comment and a, I think I even linked to my email address in the description below the video. So you can upload your video to Dropbox or Google Drive and just send me an email link. If you send me the video, it probably won't come through because I can't get emails that are hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes large. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I would love to hear you play it. And it, like you said, Internet Privacy Advocate, it doesn't, you know what, the, the tempo doesn't quite matter. Um, there might be a phrase or two that we talk about, maybe better ways of getting through something if the, if the line is broken. But I, we don't even have to go into that until um, we hear what you're doing. So that'd be great. I see we've had a bunch of new people join since we started the session. So hey, drop, us, uh, drop a, a line in the, in the chat, say where you're from. Um, what you're drinking, if it's the morning or if it's the evening, and um, feel free to ask any questions that you have. I'll give maybe a minute or two for that. Maybe not a minute or two, maybe like a few seconds, like 10 seconds. And then I've got some other, th uh, other stuff that I can talk about today too. Yes, Internet Privacy Advocate, the, yeah, skipping, yeah, that is a really, really great thing. <laughs> I, I, I think you'll probably use it a lot. Uh, and if you need, you know, just send me a message if you need a little, a little bit of help. The first time I set something up was a little confusing, so. Hey, Jose, good to see you. And hey, Dar. Uh, hey, Dar, he says, I'm literally on the last measures of Moonlight Sonata. I can't wait to record it and send it over. And you're learning it without reading a single note. Well, I mean, you're reading, what well, you're reading the notes falling. Right, so that still kind of counts, I think. <laughs> uh, unless you're doing it completely by ear, which would be 
impressive. Um, to steal a line from Darth Vader. <laughs> so that's awesome, though, Hadar. I'm really looking forward to hearing you play Moonlight Sonata. Uh, yeah. Any any questions? Any comments? Um, in the meantime, I had thought about talking a little bit more in depth about um, the video I released a week and a half ago about memorization, uh, because the video so. If somebody puts something in the chat, I will jump over and answer that before I get too far into this topic. But until then, uh, I figured I could go a little bit more in depth because the video that came out to memorize or not to memorize was, um, it was a nice overview. Oh, that's too bad that you're not gonna keep the iPad. That's too bad. <laughs> but maybe Fourscore works uh, on Android also. So, okay, um, so the video I put out about memorization was kind of, it was talking through pros and cons of memory, and um, it didn't go a whole lot further than that. And of course, you know that there's a lot of other things that we can talk about with memorization. And um, I wanted to highlight a couple things in particular that are, um, maybe just go a little bit more in depth about the, thing, the aspects of memory that don't get talked about very often. So... If we kind of dive into that and we talk about, remember, if you saw the video, um, I kind of built a pyramid out of memorization. We talked about a couple of main points that go into memorizing a piece of music. We start with sight reading something, right? Uh, and then we build on that and we learn basic muscle memories and basic ear memory, oral memory. And then we go from there and we have learned a piece and then we memorize something completely. And then the four aspects that we can work on, the four large aspects we can work on are, of course, muscle memory, which is the most, most common one. Um, oral memory, or the memory of the ear, which is probably the second most common. And then there's visual memory, and then there is uh, analytical type memory. So we're going to skip through really quickly a few of the more basic ones to get to something that's, um, I think, a little bit more interesting. So muscle memory, of course, is something that happens every time we sit down and we practice which is part of the reason I released a short a little a week, couple weeks ago about it's only perfect practice that makes perfect because every single thing that you play, you are practicing. If you practice playing a wrong note, you have practiced playing a wrong note, and it's going to be one time more difficult to undo that. If you practice wrong dynamics, it's going to be more difficult to undo that. Um, so every time we sit down and we play something, we are building muscle memory. Whether we're working on it, thinking about it consciously or not, that's what's happening. We're building muscle memory. Most of the time, we think about that as you know, uh, learning notes and rhythms and putting them in the right place. But it's even more complicated. But <laughs> grandma, <laughs> is, that, uh, is that about the um, <laughs> memorization? Or about playing everything perfectly the first time. <laughs> it's difficult to get everything right the first time, absolutely. Well, let's see. If Grandma says something else... <laughs> Grandma, you got to say something else. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, it is. All right, let's see. Uh, let me see. I haven't had to kick somebody out before. That's sad. I actually don't quite know how to do that. All right. Did that work, everybody that's still here? Just let me know, and then we'll move on. <laughs> Um, 
Yeah, okay. Well, let's go on. Let's go on. So I was in the middle of talking about um, muscle memory, practicing, all that jazz. Um, okay, so we're always doing that when we practice. The next thing that we build on top of that is um, muscle memory, kinesthetic. Uh, sorry, that's what we just talked about. Uh, ear memory. So every time we're playing or listening to a piece of music, right, we're starting to learn um, some things about what the piece sounds like. Now, I'm going to come back. If we've got time, I'll come back and tell you a bit of a story about that because there can be disconnects between um, muscle memory and what our ears are memorizing and the communication between those two. But that's not quite what I want to talk about the most today. Um, after our ear memory, there's some visual memory, right? We can remember what's happening on the page. In fact, we can kind of, if you have a photographic memory, you can actually remember what the pages look like. Um, what I used, I've never had, ne I don't have a photographic memory. Oh, grandma's back with a different user. Okay. All right. Um, so. Uh, visual memory, we can uh, think about what's on the page, and we can also uh, think about what our hands look like when they're playing, and sometimes that can be helpful. The thing that I really want to jump into today is um, talking about what analytical memory is and kind of how we can apply that, because I think that's something that is, yeah, I, I know. Well, hopefully they won't make another username, <laughs> right? And hopefully they won't come back. So analytical memory. So what does that mean? That's kind of diving into theory behind uh, what we're trying to memorize and taking it to the next step, helping, having theory inform how we're remembering things, right? So um, I actually have a piece that I thought, it's one of my own that I thought we could, wow. Okay, so um, I'm going to pull up a piece that I'm actually playing in two months from now, in December. I'm performing um, a concert of my own arrangements, and I thought I'd talk you through a little bit of, a few lines of it, and how I would go about um, working on some memory with that. So, let's see here. Okay, so you should be able to see a little bit of my screen. So we're just, this is a, uh, one of my arrangements of the James Bond theme. And obviously the first page, uh, we're not really hearing the theme yet. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So right at the beginning of this, bar three. Uh, let's see, can I even highlight some of this? Not really. But if you look at measure three, we have this kind of cadential like figure yeah and i'll play some of it for you um. so that's three yeah i know hadar <laughs> they don't like me at all it's probably just because i'm i'm live that's all so there was measure three so there's a whole lot of notes here, right? I'll switch back to here for now. There's a whole lot of notes on that page, and it can help us to remember something, especially something that changes only a little bit at a time, uh, if we have some other cues, like analytical cues. Okay, so if I go back to measure three, I wish I had a <laughs> like an intern. Does anybody want to volunteer to be my intern? <laughs> and be a moderator. <laughs> Actually, Hadar or Internet Privacy Advocate, uh, would you mind? I can actually make you, um, either of you, a moderator on the chat. And then if they pop back in, you can help get rid of them while I try to talk about this stuff. Uh, let me know. <laughs> we'll just come back here for a second. Or if there's anybody else that's on here that hasn't... Oh, okay, Hadar. Sure. <laughs> Internet privacy, will you take me up? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. If necessary. You know what? How about this, internet privacy? I will add you as a moderator and then... Um, Okay, <laughs> so I've just added you, and I think if you if they come back in, you should have some buttons on the right side of their comments. Uh, and one of them is um, to hide the user. So, okay, let's jump back into what we were talking about. Okay, so I'm going to show you back on the page that we're uh, talking about with memory here. Looking at measure three. <laughs> That looks like a whole lot of notes uh, if you're just looking at the page, uh, just looking at the bar by itself. But if we can read some basic information, we're highlighting just an E minor uh, triad, an inversion, and there's some alternating stuff going on. So first off, if I can remember, there's an E major, an E minor triad, sorry, E minor triad going on. And then in bar four, we get these D sharp, F sharp, G natural, B natural. So if we build the entire chord out, we actually have, which should sound like a lot like the James Bond chord. James Bond chord is a minor triad, major seven, and sometimes it's also got the nine on the top of the chord. Right? That should sound familiar. So, I can use two things, or three things actually here, depending on what jives with you most. I can go and say, this is an E minor triad, and then the next bar, I'm adding seven and nine. And then continuing to play the triad without the root. That can be one way to remember that. Here's just the triad, add seven and nine. Seven and nine, seven and nine, when we get to the top. The other thing that you could kind of do, if you're not used to thinking about the extended harmony like that, like sevens and nines, and or elevens and thirteens, if you're doing more jazz work like that, is you could think about E minor triad, and then instead of shifting to the upper extensions, we could think about <laughs> simply adding a B major on top of it. with a G, and the G is the last thing. So there are two different ways we can think about that. Now, of course, this is adding to the other things that we've already talked about. So I have some form of muscle memory built. I also know in my ear what it's supposed to sound like. I know how it looks on the page from reading it a lot. I know how it looks when my hands play it. Yeah? So we can add to that, and then we can say, here's another uh, harmonic analysis. It doesn't have to be like a Roman numeral analysis. It doesn't have to be really, really complicated theory. It can be anything that helps you remember what happens from one bar to the next bar, right? So. Get to the top of this. Back. Top of the, the line here. This is the 6-4 bar that starts the second in the, in the second system. There's two bars in a row that are almost exactly the same. We can use that as one thing that helps us memorize. The right hand is doing this alternating octave um, motion. The left hand, despite it not being played with scale fingering, Despite that not being played with scale fingering, it's actually just an E minor scale, harmonic minor. Whoops. So the whole way down, if we know our scale now, there's another uh, theoretical component we can add. We know the notes that go into E harmonic minor. I'm just stringing them together. Right? Okay. Uh, and then let's talk about one more spot here. Uh, in the meantime, if you've got a question, drop a question in the chat. Drop a question in the chat.
So if we continue down, another line. Let's see, this is starting at measure eight. So that starts the second system on the page now. Now, in measure nine, well, let's go back a second. Measure six, seven, eight. Yes, internet privacy. Look for patterns. Absolutely. And not just, not just patterns um, like the typical patterns that you see, right? We can see that, for example, the right hand is doing that. That's an easy pattern to see, but we can also see other things, but we have to dive in a little bit more, right? So like finding out that scale, that is looking for a pattern that we know, but applying it in a different way than we might be used to, right? Sometimes, especially if we play um, Baroque or classical period music, scales are gonna be used almost exactly the way we usually practice them. In something like this, it's not. I'm not gonna use scale fingering. Right? But if I know scales and stacked chords, yeah, perfect. But if I know what, how those are built, I can absolutely see what's happening. Right? And then on top of that, we can create some bigger patterns too. So we said, going back to the music here, measure four, five, six, the six, four bar at the top of the pay, at the top of the screen right now, the six, four bar starts a one measure long pattern. Well, that pattern is then just dropped an octave. And then it's dropped another octave. And all we do is we add the octaves in the right hand. So there's three, there's three measures. Uh, let's see, from the top of that. Same pattern, same pattern. And then we get to the next bar after that, and it changes. So that's what that is. And if we flip back there really quick. We've got, uh, so I'm looking at measure nine. We continue, we start with a similar idea. Right? But we're starting on a different note. It's no longer G, but now we have B. And then the right hand reverses direction. Now that's a bar that in particular, measure nine here, I would be focusing on more muscle memory to guide the memorization process and a little bit of ear memory. And then the bit of analytical memory that I would use is knowing exactly where the tritone happens. So a tritone is F sharp in the bottom and C on the top. And if we go back to the page, you'll see that it's, I'm gonna point this out for you. If you can see the cursor on the screen, there's our F sharp. And here in the right hand, because we're in bass clef, we switched clefs, here's our C. So between the two hands, we've got F sharp and C. So I want to memorize where that point happens because um, after it, the hands play, um, we'll call it unison. They play in octaves. Same notes. So we start, reverse direction, tritone. After that follows octaves. So yes, uh, Depending on what I need, let's say, uh, in a performance, I will be doing a lot of subconscious muscle memory thinking, if we can call subconscious work thinking. But beyond that, let's say I need a cue for something, or oh, this happens once in a while. You have a dress rehearsal, or the day that you're performing, something that's never really been tricky or gone wrong before, all of a sudden there's like, hmm, this doesn't feel as comfortable as it used to. Maybe this bar is one of them. There's a bunch of things that I can latch onto mentally to help remember <laughs> how to trigger the next actions to happen, right? So um, it's kind of like building extra bridges between our muscle memory and our ear memory and our visual memory in case one of them fails. So the more those bridges we can build, the less place that the less places we're going to have where we could possibly have a memory slip, um, or possibly just even if we're not talking about the stress of playing live and the memory slips that are caused by that, 
uh, if we're just talking about simply being able to remember what happens from one note to the next or one measure to the next, um, just these little kinds of cues, little things where we say, like I just said, I found the tritone and then after the tritone, the hands line up, right? Uh, so we can look and find all kinds of things um, in music that help us pinpoint those little things. Internet privacy, you said, oh, thank you. This is what makes my writing good. <laughs> I appreciate that. Simple elements. Yeah. Yeah, there are things I, I try. So <laughs> just going off of what you just said there. Um, I really try to capture lists. Um, I don't know, his kind of perspective on writing transcriptions and things like that. In that, uh, arguably, except for maybe the transcendental etudes and some of Liszt's other etudes, Liszt is very pianistic. And it's challenging, sure, it's very challenging, but it fits in the hand really well. It fits in the hand better than even other p composers for piano. And that's something that I really try to latch onto. So even though the writing is, is on the virtuosic level to play it at the tempo required, you know... We've got to have good facility to play that. Or uh, let me show you the next page. Speaking of list. If you've played any list etudes, this should look actually quite familiar. Um, it's, <laughs> it's a mechanism, a compositional mechanism that list used all the time in his writing. Uh, so that kind of thing. <laughs> That's more difficult. But in general, I try to apply things that, that uh, ideas that Liszt would have used to keep it pianistic, to keep it playable in, uh, you know, a reasonable, within reason, let's say, which uh, is different than some other composers that might do just some crazy reaches or some really awkward leaps and things between the hands. Um, not to pick on any of them, but for example, Brahms is known for being quite difficult for pianists and um, not just difficult, but um, he doesn't allow the pianist to do things that we normally find in other uh, piano composers. So sometimes there's not places for the hand to relax. It just stays stretched out covering these massive, massive chords. Um, Brahms, more than any other composer that I am aware of, has, has injured more pianists uh, yeah, Brahms has injured more pianists than any other composer that I'm aware of. <laughs> um, so that's why I went to him in particular. Um, it's beautiful, beautiful music. And it's arguably not as technically hard as Liszt, but the pianism part is, is quite different. So we've had a, some people in and out and in and out throughout the session today, but um, Jose, you, <laughs> you want to see that one? Okay, I'll give it a whirl. Whirl. <laughs> um, let's see here. <laughs> By the way, I don't have to play this for another two months. I've just started working on it again. That was uh, the next couple lines because it all kind of fits into one thing. That went okay. <laughs> um, it'll be better in two months from now. <laughs> but thanks for the challenge, Jose. <laughs> um, so any other questions? Any other questions? I could uh, continue a little bit about the memory stuff, but I don't want to, I want to make sure that if there's, uh, yes, it, I think it would be a great encore. Ironically, I'm playing it as a closer to the first half of my program. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, I think it would be a cool encore. It gets even crazier uh, after this. So, 
Anyway, if there's a question, Haydar, um, Jose, internet privacy, I know we answered a little bit about the, the uh, tablet stuff. Uh, so yeah, thank, uh, thanks for that question. But yeah, if anybody else, if you've got a question, uh, let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to continue telling stories. Inked piano. Yeah, waltz technique. Please, please ask about waltz technique. And let me know if you're playing a particular waltz um, or if this is just a general question about a lot of repertoire, too. I'll pull up something here. My usual. I've got... Um, Okay, elbow and wrist pain in the left hand after five minutes. That's not great. Let's try to figure out what's happening there. It's the etude. Hmm, I am not familiar with that one. Let me see if I can Google it. So while I do that, while I do that, um, the motion, the, is it really waltz motion? Is it like an octave and then up to a chord? I'm stuck in E minor here. <laughs> Or is it a single note and up to a chord? Okay, so it's probably the octave because I, I think you were writing correct about the octave. Um, let me still see if I can uh, find the piece on Google. And if I can't, in just a few seconds, then we'll just dive into um, general waltz technique. Oh, nice. So I've got something here from MuseScore. It's not generally the place that I would recommend going to, but it's quick. Let's see here. Piano, is this the is this the right version? Is it a bass note like this? Or is it further away? Uh, and that'll help determine a little bit of my answer to your question. Let me play a little bit of it again, and then we'll go back to uh, oh great, some of the questions that we got coming in here. That piece. Later on it opens up to bigger chords. Okay, so I'm like looking at measure 130. Yeah. Okay, so there are a couple things that we need to pay attention to uh, going through waltzes, whether they're like this or, yeah, awesome, I'm glad I found the right spot. Whether they're like this and we've got this is basically an octave, well, it's a tenth between the lowest note and the highest note uh, here. So depending on the size of your hand, I like to recommend two different types of fingerings to tackle passages like this. Um, this said it was quarter note equals 100. So that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be all that quick. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's great. So, two quick answers for you, Inked. The safest way to go about and uh, playing figures like this is to continue to feel them like we felt the smaller ones in that we're going to let five come up from the lowest note and we're probably gonna play the upper notes instead of stretching like this. We're gonna play the upper note with one and five also. Hey, Louise. Good to see you. <laughs> so we're gonna let five come up and then play one. 
And what that's doing is it's keeping my hand in this exact shape. So I'm not doing any stretch like this, and I'm not staying stretched out trying to reach five, back to two and one. So let me show you that also. Um, let's see if we can see it. I might have to change octaves. Uh, here we go. <laughs> okay, so here's five, and it comes up. Five. And if I do it up, maybe an octave, this will be a little easier to see. Five, it comes up. We just move the whole hand. Okay, so first thing, because of the tempo and because it's not super fast, we can get away with doing something like that. And it keeps our hand from being too stretched out. And it keeps it in actually, because our biggest stretch is just a sixth from between E and C. The next bar, G to D and B. The hand always kind of stays in that shape, which is really nice. We can add something to that where we feel like the, yes, absolutely. I would recommend it because as soon as you start playing waltzes that are spread even further than this, you're going to have pieces, uh, of course, by Chopin, but even others, even like Ludovico Einaudi, which uh, if you like this, you probably like uh, some of his stuff too. We're going to have notes that are down low, and we're going to have to skip almost two octaves. If I do something, a similar motion here. Jose, I'm actually, that was the next thing I was going to talk about, about the left hand and a little bit more technique there. Um, so I really recommend if you can get used to, yes, the accuracy. And you've got a piece here where it gives you time to find that. Here's a little tip about accuracy across jumps. Only aim for one of the fingers. Don't try to aim for both. If you find that your fifth finger is less precise, aim for five, but still put one in the right place. I'm not a fan of just practicing five to five because as soon as we add the thumb back in, we have built a different muscle memory than we're using to play actually the whole chord. Okay, so that's the first thing. And then going back to Jose's question about this in particular, I am feeling the left hand as, it's not exactly a rebound, but it is a, like a, an impulse that throws me off the key. It feels, so Ink says, it feels like I'm running away from finger five. And you so yes, okay, we want, let's isolate some of those um, motions that we have. So if we're already, if we're feeling stretched and already moving away, as soon as five is played, we're gonna get into this feeling that the hand is like this, that is, precisely what's causing pain, probably. Because if we stay stretched, and five stretches to three and one, three and one also causes a really big stretch in this part of the hand here. So it is possible to play five and three and one, but I would use the same technique as I'm using to play five to five and one, which is that five lifts, and then we play three and one five, and then three and one. And let me show you from the top again. Ah, uh, right notes. So I wouldn't just feel like I'm staying stretched out and trying to cover the whole thing. Uh, the other thing that I might, no, I'm not going to recommend that. <laughs> if you do have larger hands, it's a more difficult technique, and you can play 5-3-1, 5-3-1. You're welcome, Inked. <laughs> there are a couple more, a couple more things. So we can stay stretched out and play that, but it really, really still needs to feel like these are separate motions where the hand is contracting between at least a little bit. Okay, and then let's see. So uh, Jose said a sort of like a plucking of five. Yeah, it does feel like sort of a plucking of five. 
Yeah. And even here's a really important thing to see. Watch the position of my hand after I release five with the pedal. So if I paused, hopefully if I paused the video, in between motions, that's what the hand would look like. So just a quick and easy attack that springs. It feels like the key is pushing me out instead of me depressing the key. It feels, it's like the opposite. Key pushes me out, hand relaxes. And then I make an arc over the top to come to the new position. Now, unfortunately, we can't do, we can't use that same kind of technique to get back down to the root, uh, to our bass note when it changes, like here, here. Because if we spring off the upper notes, whether we're playing them with one and five or one and three, as soon as we create that springing motion or the plucking motion, we're gonna end up accenting it. And we don't wanna do that because in three, it's only the first beat that gets the natural accent. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Yes, so that's, those are my recommendations, Inked, because we really wanna um, perfect letting the hand relax between things. In fact, the exact question that you had was almost precisely, this isn't Brahms, but it's almost precisely what I see injured pianists that play Brahms. Um, whether it's simple Brahms or more difficult Brahms, it is letting, keeping the hand too spread out and trying to do too much with it that way. And one other thing about the pain in particular, when you feel pain, that is your body te actually telling you, you've already been doing this wrong thing for a long period of time. Uh, you do that in adjustment with octaves. Yes. <laughs> yeah, when you have to, right? When, you have, when you're left with no choice, when it's something like this, we have to be really conscious of that choice to say, I'm going to let go. Even though you probably can reach just about all of it. Right? But the feeling of running or the feeling of stretching away kind of before you've even played the note, uh, we want to avoid that. Not only for technical reasons, but also um, for musical reasons. Because if we're already running away before we played something, then we're never really giving ourselves the time to sink in and let the note speak the best way that it can. Feeling the bottom of the key. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and internet privacy says waltz is like stride. Absolutely. <laughs> I find stride piano so incredibly difficult to play. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm just not a fan of, or, you know, it's not a thing that I do. <laughs> um, you could drop notes, internet privacy advocate says, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. We don't want to, while we're learning, we don't want to, um, for the sake of technique, if we're trying to build better technique and we're working on that in particular, I wouldn't get rid of anything. We need to figure out a way to make it, to be able to execute it. Now, if we're going, coming to another point and we're saying, I'm only playing this for fun and I'm not, I might play it for some family and friends. Okay, fine. But if we're really trying to better our technique, let's figure out a way to, um, actually execute all of it. So let me jump back here. We had some other great questions. So going back to the very first one that came in here, Internet Privacy Advocate, what about distance of bench to piano to alleviate pain? That could be something that we could look at. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there, so I'll just do a quick thing about distance. There's a lot of misinformation, especially on the internet, when you can seemingly find answers to everything. Um, there are a lot of people that are piano teachers that tell you to sit close to the instrument and have your elbow at your side like this. Now, you can already see, if I'm gonna play with my elbow at my side, you see how different my position already is from where I was sitting just now. Uh, this is bad for multiple reasons. 
and it can actually prohibit us in a waltz figure like this. If we're too close, we're going to put a lot more strain on the wrist in even different places than they should be. And then when we have to cross the body, the wrist makes this really awkward turn and that can really quickly cause pain, injury, other kinds of things. <laughs> um, I'm just laughing to internet privacy's latest chat. <laughs> um, so if I scoot back to the position that is best to sit in, first thing, you should be able to lift your knee up at the piano. It shouldn't be stuck underneath. Whether you're at the piano or at a keyboard, it shouldn't be stuck underneath. That's your first test. Most of the time, this gets our arm in the right place. Okay, now next thing, if I sit very um, perpendicular to the camera, you can see that there is, my forearm isn't coming straight down at my side. It is out a little bit. And if you watch any concert pianist, well, almost any, except some of the older guys, Horowitz, Glenn Gould, We'll talk about that in a second. Um, most of the pianists today that are taught posture, we have the body further away from the instrument and our arms are out in front of us. This facilitates a lot more mobility left and right. I was touching the fall board. So Ink says you sit, let's see, stretched out with closed fists, knuckles touching the fall board. That's about right. I think that's perfect. I like that. Okay, so let's leave that one be for now. <laughs> but yes, right distance can incorporate, that can cause problems if we're sitting too close or if we're sitting too far away. Um, yeah, I, I like to use the knee thing uh, for me in particular, but this looks like it does the same thing and it relates exactly to arm length. Usually leg length and arm length are proportional for most people. Um, so you can also, you can give that a try and see if you can also raise your knee um, and see if that works for you. Let's jump back up. Hey, Joseph, good to see you. <laughs> and I saw SMP Music Link Studio. Thanks for being here. So, Haydar, jumping back up to your question, Haydar, in your opinion, should I abandon learning C sharp scales and go for something like E or G? Because last time you said it's a bit difficult. Um, hmm. Learn E major and C sharp minor at the same time because they're relatives. So E major will get you started and you don't have to switch up your fingering. Um, obviously we start on one in the right hand and the cross happens where it happens just like in C major, which is usually people's first scale. So learn E major, for sure learn E major. Subsequently G is gonna feel quite similar it's so obviously not the same notes, but the crosses in both the right hand and the left hand happen exactly the same. Now, once we know E major, we can go back to C sharp minor. And we can start to see on the keyboard, we're playing the same pattern of notes, but we're just starting in a different place. That's how I love to think about scales that way, major scales, minor scales. The, they're relatives, right? Because they're using the same set of pitches. E major, C sharp minor, use the same set of pitches, exactly. They just start in a different place in the pattern. And unfortunately, yeah, I mean, I suppose you could even use the same finger. You could start with that. Here's an example, Hadar. If we play E major, the easier one to start with, and we get up to C sharp, Look at the finger that you're playing with. It's three. When we play C sharp minor, we'll start on the third finger. Play three, four, one. In fact, I could play a C sharp minor scale. <laughs> I'm starting on C sharp, and it sounds like it fits with E, because it does. It's the same group of pitches. And uh, yeah, same, vice versa. I can play E major with an E chord and I can play E major with a C sharp chord. There's also some harmonic stuff going on there too, but basically that's my answer. Learn E first, G will come very quickly. 
but you can jump right into C sharp and use your knowledge that you've learned about E major to help inform um, what's going on in C sharp since it's your relative. Um, you can always think about learning relatives um, at the same time, really, uh, unless that's confusing. But if it is a little confusing, you can start with the major, get comfortable with that one, and then add its relative minor. Hey, Dar, do you know how relative majors and minors work? Let me know, and I can always explain that a little bit more. Let's see. Let's see. I answered Jose. Sort of a plucking. Um, so, Internet Privacy has said before, while we were working on the waltz figure, uh, to look for the most comfortable fingering over time. Let the hand fall where it wants to naturally. So, yeah, that can be... Fingering is a really difficult thing to teach. And it's actually a really good, difficult thing to... Um, it's a difficult concept to grasp for people because some of us have different, let's say, proclivities. We, we tend toward playing with different fingers. And when we're at a beginner level, an intermediate level, it's going to be really important to use specific fingerings, maybe that the composer intended or that it's printed in the edition. Now, if we're playing something else, like this waltz we just talked about, that doesn't have any fingerings. We have a lot of choices. Right. And there, <laughs> yes, if I was working with you in person, I would probably give you, you can play this with these fingers and with these fingers and with these fingers. And there's a lot of ones and we would experiment and see what your hand does best. Um, but there are other things that fingering, we need to develop certain fingering, right? And there are certain fingerings that don't feel great the first time you play them, but are absolutely necessary to accomplish the piece. Um, <laughs> um, I'm blanking a little bit on an example of that, but there are plenty of times where we, uh, this is going way, way, way advanced, but for example, um, uh, let's see, how does it go? Uh, the Chopin second etude in, yeah, <laughs> obviously I, I've never played that one. But that top fingering is extremely awkward. Four, uh, yeah, four, three, four, five, three, four, three, four, five, three. <laughs> that's really important because it's the absolute only way to execute it. Now that's a super advanced piece and example. But you'll find areas in repertoire like that where there is maybe one Man, two, there's one for sure, maybe two ways to get around playing a passage at tempo and playing all of the notes because we have to organize our hand and our movements accordingly. Uh, and in those cases, we can't let ourselves go with what's comfortable f at, with the hand, especially at slow tempos, because at slow tempos, we can kind of play anything with any fingering. As soon as we start to speed up, we're going to run into all kinds of problems. Um, so that's one reason... We usually don't talk about fingering on here, but if people have fingering questions, those are absolutely great questions to have. Um, there are, so like I said, there are different ways of accomplishing it sometimes. Uh, but sometimes it can be really difficult if you don't have, especially if you don't have a teacher you're working with in person and taking music too regularly, it can be really difficult to find, well, here's how it works at a slow tempo, but then when I speed it up, it doesn't work anymore. And figuring out why it doesn't work anymore and how to make it work again, uh, that's a complicated thing. So <laughs> I'm always here. If people have questions about fingering, you can always come back and ask things like that. Um, I have found many times over the course of my life that um, fingering, especially when, um, let's say I was starting to learn a piece of music and I hadn't brought it into my teacher yet, uh, and I'm, I'm younger, and... Uh, I bring something in and I'm working at it at a slow tempo and they say, okay, great. Well, this is working well, but you're going to have a problem. And they could point it out to me before I'd done too much practicing a certain way. That's really great. It's really difficult when you practice a lot, let's say a month, two months, three months, and then we need to change a fingering because it's the finger, finger choice that's prohibiting us from taking the tempo another 5 BPM or another 10 BPM faster. 
Oh, once you have something that works, don't change it. Yes, as long as it works. And I guess we could, we could sit and argue about the definition of that. <laughs> um, yeah, so if it works, fine. Absolutely. <laughs> um, let's go back up. Yes, Internet Privacy Advocate, you said to work hands separately. Yeah, that's also a good thing. Da, 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 da. Was that all the questions we have so far? That was. Oh, my goodness. Well, thanks for the, com the comments in the chat and everybody kind of chiming in. That was great. Um, yeah, Internet privacy, you say start with practical fingering. Yes, and yeah, that and the fact that it's really difficult sometimes to know what the most practical fingering is. Um, so... Uh, see, you also said Chopin, Chopin seems to have sat pretty far back from the piano, at least in some of the pictures of him. Um, I'd have to take a look at that. There are some pictures of some of the great composers, yes, sitting quite far away. There's one actually of um, Haydn that was super informative in my younger years. And it was a picture, it was a, like a pencil drawing of Haydn sitting at the keyboard, like arms fully extended, <laughs> like this. Uh, and also playing, I can't even talk into the microphone and do it, but playing with his leaning back, kind of like that. <laughs> and it's something that actually, because I was sitting too close at the time, uh, my teacher pointed that out and said, take a look at this. And we didn't take it to that extreme. <laughs> um, but yeah, and if you could watch videos today on YouTube and other places, you'll see uh, a variety of postures. But most, most often today, pianists are sitting further away than they used to. Since there's not another question, if there is, type it in the chat and we'll, we'll make that maybe the last question of the day today. Um, but until that point, um, I've seen some talk about <laughs> online, let's say on Facebook in particular and some of the groups, uh, talking about posture at the piano, and I've seen some people reference Glenn Gould <laughs> because Glenn, Glenn Gould's posture was very um, different than, you know, <laughs> what we see today. He sat very low and very close to the piano, and there are some people that don't, that are self-taught online. Hey, Stanley, I will come back to you in just a second. This is, this is great. Thanks. Yes, and inked. I'm going to come back to that, what you just said about Long Long as well. Um, so I see comments about Glenn Gould and where he sat, and some people say, well, if it worked for Glenn Gould, it can work for me. And people don't realize that while Glenn Gould was a fantastic pianist and a revolutionary interpreter, whether you agree with his interpretations or don't, um, it was, he was revolutionary for sure, but people don't realize <laughs> yes, Joseph, it seems like, yeah, a lot of posture and Alexander technique today. <laughs> um, what people don't realize about Glenn Gould is that he actually had to stop playing. He couldn't play for more than a few minutes at a time. And most of his late recordings are all spliced together of only a few minutes of playing and then a few minutes of playing and a few minutes of playing because his posture had absolutely ruined his, ability, his, his body. It had ruined his ability to play. He couldn't sit and play something uh, without being in pain for more than a handful of minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes. Um, and it was very much due to his posture. So it's really alarming when I see people say, well, it worked for him. Mm. He happened to be able, he happened to be such a great musician and have such talent that he made it work for him for as long as he could. And then when it didn't work anymore, he could not play. So, that's my little side note about posture and some of the things that I've seen online. Um, <clears throat> Stanley, so Stanley says, how do you quickly get used to a new piano when performing? You have a digital at home and playing on a grand makes you trip up. Um, the quickest answer, Stanley, is practicing playing on different instruments. So can you find, if you have a digital at home, can you find one, can you go to a store and play on a couple other digitals? Can you go to a store and play on a couple pianos? Grand pianos, upright pianos. Um, if you have a church that you belong to, do they have another instrument to play? 
if you have, um, gosh, maybe there's a restaurant. I don't want you to play. You don't have to play in front of people, but maybe you can ask them about playing something um, when no one's around. I'm just trying to think of ways that we could get you in front of more and more pianos so that the particular time that you have to go from practicing at home to performing isn't the only time that we're experiencing that transition from instrument to instrument. And just because uh, you have a digital and you're moving to a grand, so part of the, I call it the plight of the pianist, is that we never get the same instrument to perform on, no matter where we go, no matter what level. We, I mean, except if you're Vladimir Horowitz or Van Cliburn, who are two of the pianists that traveled with their own instruments. Um, and no, nobody today does that. So if you're not one of them, then um, we always have a different piano to play. And they always feel different. Even if you have a grand at home that you get to practice on, the concert piano is always going to feel different because it's a different instrument. So the more, first thing, the more that you do have other instruments to play and you can get used to that, the better. And that doesn't have to be limited to going from um, digital to an acoustic or to a grand or to an upright. It could be from digital to digital because those also feel different, right? Um, the second thing, this is a bit more challenging, but what I do is I like to, if I sit down at a new piano, never played it before, and it's in a new space, um, I quickly go through, th through some scales. And then maybe I have a handful of phrases in repertoire that I might also play. It doesn't have to be anything that's even on my program. Um, and I'll go through a handful of phrases that I have played and experienced a lot. So things I've practiced a lot. Maybe if you're preparing for a performance, this is not something that you're performing today, but it's something you performed in the past or it's something that you play for fun uh, and something that you've played a lot. Go through a couple passages. It doesn't have to be a whole piece. And hopefully within a few minutes of exploring something that's way more comfortable for us, your body is going to get an immediate idea of the shifts that need to happen. If you can explore those most with things that you've already played, or if you don't have one, scales, right? Because especially, or if you've got exercises or short etudes that you play, uh, things that like are your typical warm up. Explore the new piano with those first before you, if you have time, before you just jump into playing repertoire on them. Um, and we could go into more detail about there might be certain things we need to remember about certain notes or certain registers of the keyboard. Overall, that gets really, really difficult. No matter what level you are, that gets really difficult. Um, a few years ago, I was playing a, uh, a Yamaha CFX in the Chicago area. And I had a dress rehearsal on the piano. So we had a couple hours, actually, to get used to it. But um, the middle register was just really dull. And in the end, there wasn't a whole lot I could do in my playing to get it to speak the way I really wanted it to. And so instead, I had to change the way I played my repertoire around it and the way I played the passages around when I needed to use that middle register. If the middle register had a melody in it, I had to play, let's say the accompaniment for, to keep it simple here, the accompaniment I had to adjust that on the fly with almost no practice. Um, so that's why the m just the more practice you have doing it on different instruments, the better. And if you have a digital at home, maybe you can also even change the velocity curve. Uh, that could be something. Or if you use a digital through a computer, you can definitely do that. That immediately makes your piano feel like it's a different instrument. Or pull up a different preset, pull up a different sample library. Um, if it's difficult to get out and explore things. I find that even on, I play the same digital keyboard for all of my stuff, but if I'm using different presets or different libraries, the touch is all different, the programming's all different. It feels almost as different as going from this piano, my home acoustic piano, to a concert piano. Um, so I hope that answers uh, some, of your, some of your questions. Yeah. <coughs> Ink says you went to see Long Lawn on Monday in London and had the pleasure to meet him. That's really, really cool. <laughs> um, he moves his elbows a lot and he stretches many, many times, very dynamic. Yeah, Long Lawn, 
that has a basis. The foundation of good piano technique is movement and things like that. But he takes it way beyond that, and he makes theatrical type gestures while he plays. Um, so that's um, I don't actually teach any students to to mimic that kind of playing. If it happens to be you and your personality, great. But if it's not, um, it looks really strange. <laughs> Joseph, uh, when you say he gets injured also, are you talking about Long Long? Um, let's see, internet privacy said, depends on your level. Beginners like music that's fingered. Really, Joseph, I haven't heard that, um, I haven't heard about Long Long getting injured. Uh, but I would imagine he, um, I mean, he plays an extraordinary amount. He's touring all the time. An internet says, uh, I don't like overly grimacing pianists. There are some, I will, Joseph, I'll, I'll look that up. Um, <laughs> there are some videos out, like once a year, it'll be a compilation of the best pianist faces over the last year. They're hilarious. Uh, <laughs> he says he broke a nail on a ma in a master class. <laughs> That's funny. Um... Uh, going back to Internet's uh, comment about fingering. Yeah, fingering, especially when it's not a beginner th thing anymore, fingering is all dependent on the editor of the score. So if we're playing, let's say, a full-on classical piece of music that's a part of the traditional canon, um, the fingering choice is almost never the composer's. It's always the editor's choice. And e the editor is a pianist and a human, just like the rest of us playing. And so they are suggesting fingering, and they have good ideas, and there is validity underneath their suggestion. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best choice for everybody. Um, so fingering really depends on the editor, and s uh, sometimes you might find an editor in particular will make fingering choices that really work for you. So if you're reading some piece of music and... And you say, oh, wow, a lot of these are working. 90%, 95% are working. You can look for that editor's edition of other pieces that you want to play. And that can be a great way of getting some really nice suggestions for fingering. If they don't work, try to avoid buying more music from that editor. Uh, and if we're getting music off IMSLP, well, that'll leave some things to be desired. But at least we get access to the music. Um, and hopefully not just the fingering is good, but also the notes are right, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, Joseph says, um, <laughs> yeah, I think we were talking about um, Glenn Gould when you said this. The only thing that you get from that, the, the posture, Glenn Gould's posture is damage, uh, <laughs> muscle damage and nerve damage. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Let's see. Stanley, I see you said, I feel like I'm also quite alarmed at the volume, the volume of a grand piano because you set your digital quite low. Yeah. Actually, I found all of my students that practice on a digital instrument at home, they tend to not, one, they haven't practiced syncing all the way to the bottom of the key. Uh, because sometimes digital speak before you get to the bottom of the key. The sound still comes out. And two, the reason that you say um, a lot of people with digitals practice at a low volume for a variety of reasons. It could be other people in the house. It could be that you're in an apartment and you just you can't have the loud sound. Uh, if you can put headphones on, that's another thing that changes us, that changes our perception from sitting on the bench and playing acoustically. But at least if you, have, if you can't play something louder because of other reasons that you can't control, if you put headphones on, even better if you can get a Bluetooth connection and put wireless headphones or earbuds in, um, then we can still hear something that's a bit louder. I have, um, so I was going to, uh, my in-person students that I've had that have digitals at home and then they come to a grand, six foot, seven foot, nine foot grand, they all of a sudden start playing everything two to three dynamics softer. And yeah, part of that is a large grand piano is built to fill a large space. So 
if you're playing a seven footer or a nine footer, they're meant to be put really in rooms that are that can fit you know two hundred people to thousands of people, and they're loud enough to fill those spaces. So if you have a large piano like that and it's not in a space that's that large, and if you're mo if you're moving to a piano like that and it's not in a space that large, it can be overwhelming the difference in volume. But we want to see. You can do another couple tests when you sit down and play an instrument like that. You can play some really big chords, really loud chords, and say, this is what fortissimo sounds like on this piano. Feel that. You can actually feel the sound vibration kind of ringing through your body, actually vibrating you and the floor and the bench. Feel what that's like for the instrument to do that. And then we can, from that point, from the loudest point, we can bring things down and say, here's forte. Here's mezzo forte, mezzo piano, piano, etc. And now all of a sudden, the difference, we can still feel like we get to sink in and play exactly like we want to. Um, and we do have this massive range of sound. Um, so that's one thing I would suggest. Start at the top of the dynamic range and then work your way down, feeling the different dynamics on the piano, not just with your hands, but also feeling, hearing what it's like and f feeling in your body what that feels like, because it does it is a dramatic difference. Absolutely. Yes, internet says tendonitis is real and dangerous. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. Today has been a bit more about um, health than some of our other online, uh, our, our other Q and A's. But I'm always a fan of that because the longer that you can all play and play healthily, <laughs> the more enjoyment you're going to have out of playing. Um, and also, usually healthy technique also goes hand in hand with more efficient technique, which means better, more virtuosic playing, or at least putting us on a road to get to more virtuosic playing. Um, great. This has been a great session today. Um, so I think we're going to wrap it up. If people have questions in the meantime, drop them in the um, comments below the video. That's always the best place to drop comments. And if you have a question, drop it there, and I'll pick it up next time we start. Um, thanks for, at the beginning of today, <laughs> your patience with me, with the uh, spammer that we had. That was no fun. And um, yeah. Oh, also remember, you can always submit a video of your playing. So Stanley, Joseph, if you haven't been here, before if this is your first time, uh, we do video master classes too. So if users submit a video, if you want to submit a video of your playing of any piece in particular, could be even at any stage in your playing, um, I'll show it on the class and we'll talk about it live and give feedback. And uh, uh, that's always one of the areas that I have the most fun teaching everybody because then I get to actually reflect as if we're having a one-on-one -on -one lesson uh, and see what you're doing and hear it and all that stuff. So. Feel free, Stanley or Joseph or anybody else. Um, there's a link uh, to do that also in the description below this video. So you can go follow that and it, all it takes is a cell phone video. Um, oh, an inked piano too. If you've got, if you want to submit anything, like if you want, if you're working on the etude and you want to submit a video of, playing, of you playing it, then just send it in. Uh, Joseph, what, um, as far as to send in a video, if you send me the actual video file and like upload that to Google Drive or to Dropbox or another file, file sharing system like that, and then send me the link to download it. Um, I, can't w I can't play other videos from YouTube very well because I can't control the ads that get shown and I don't want to show any ads on the live stream. Um, so that's one thing. I don't mind actually if you've got a channel, I don't mind sharing it with people at all. Um, so I'm happy to do that, but, um, yeah, I can't, <laughs> I just can't control, um, what YouTube shows or how long the ad is going to be. If we can click, you know, you know how that all works. So if you can send me the actual video file and then I'll have it set up on my laptop and, um, just be ready to share it with everybody. Okay. Thanks again so much <laughs> for today's, all of the questions and all of the, the chat back and forth. Um, fun, fun session. And um, yeah, until next time, I'll look forward to, uh, to seeing hopefully many, many of you again. Uh, Joseph, the edited one is great. Either one. 
Either one. And Inked Piano, you're starting to learn Morning Prayer from Tchaikovsky. Awesome. Yes. So I hope to see all of you again. Uh, we always do these uh, every two weeks. We start at 10 o'clock a.m. Mountain Time, and hopefully you know about what time that is for you. And um, yeah, always feel free to drop questions in the meantime, or come back and join the chat, and we'll answer. I answer everything that I possibly can. <laughs> All right. Okay, so until next time, <laughs> practice smarter, not harder. <laughs> and I'll see you next time you visit Pianist Academy. All right.